This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. I'm Ray Fouché. I'm the resident associate for the Center of Advanced Study, leading the theme of interpreting technoscience. And I will be introducing our speaker today, Kelly Joyce. Um, Kelly is a, a good and old friend of mine, and um, I, I'm really happy to have her here. Um, we've laughed plenty of times already, and uh, I think that's been great. Um, Kelly's an associate professor of sociology in the um, in, of sociology at the College of William, William and Mary. Prior to beginning at William and Mary, she was a lecturer at Harvard University and a teaching fellow at Boston College. She's currently also the national program, national science for the science, technology, and society program. She's the author of and editor of two books. Um, the first one that she'll probably be talking about today is entitled Magnetic Appeal, um, published by Cornell University Press. And the second is Technogenarians, Studying Health and Illness Through an Aging Technology and a Science Lens from Wiley and Blackwell. She has published a series of articles in a variety of locations from social, Sociology of, of Health and Medicine, the Indian Journal of Gerontology, Sciences Culture, and Social Studies of Science. Um, her main areas of specialization are medical sociology, science and technology studies, and various forms of social theory. Um, today she'll be giving a talk entitled Visualizing Health, Magnetic Reson image Resonance Imaging, and Public Culture in American Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Joyce. So what I'm going to talk about today is how MRI, or Magnetic Resonance Imaging, is talked about in American popular culture and compare how these stories relate to the technology's actual use in clinical practice. Um, by doing this, we're going to see that there are cultural meanings attached to MRI and imaging technologies that make it harder to understand how human decisions and technological limitations shape the content and use of MRI scans. And I just want to preface this by saying, of course, I think MRI is a great technology. I'm not at all saying, let's get rid of it. Let's go back to not having this technology. And believe me, I do have to make that preface before, you <laughs> before I talk about this issue. Um, so this is what a typical MRI scan looks like. They're grayscale images. Um, and I just want to point out, too, my website is up there, and I have articles and links to other topics, um, other areas of research, if you're interested. So MRI is just one of many imaging technologies that have become crucial to medical practice and popular culture in the United States. And today, our medical imaging technology arsenal and the, the uh, military metaphor is intentional um, because that's what's often used in these literatures. Our X-ray ultrasound, single um, photon emission computed tomography or SPECT, computerized axial tomography or CT or CAT scans, you might have heard of them, and that way MRI and positron emission tomography or PET scans. X-ray was developed in the late 1890s while the rest of these technologies uh, were developed after World War II. Although the output of these techniques are anatomical pictures, they each draw on different kinds of knowledge and basic science. For example, ultrasound draws on sonography and uh, sonar technology, and um, MRI draws on work in physics and chemistry and knowledge of nuclear magnetic resonance. So although the output looks like pictures, how they're getting there is very, very different. Unlike X-ray, most of the post-World War technologies, so CT, ultrasound, MRI, they start with numerical measurements of different qualities of our bodies. And then these measurements are transformed through computer programs um, into pictures. So the thing to remember as we go through this, this talk is that none of these uh, pictures are straightforward pictures in any sense of the word. Where there are many layers of translation that occur between the body and the output. 
of each technology. So imaging technologies from X-ray to now have always had a hold on the popular imagination in the U.S. X-rays, if you guys might have heard, uh, were used in shoe stores, and you could get your foot X-rayed back in the day. And, and now, more recently, we've seen ultrasound images show up as logos for TV production companies. Um, and you can even have an ultrasound fetal shot put on a coffee mug. So medical images have never stayed contained within medical practice alone. They've always been showing up in different ways in uh, popular culture. Of all these technologies that are up on the board, I'm going to focus on one of them, MRI. So before we get started, what is an MRI machine system and how does it work? So an MRI system does not use uh, X-ray technology. It's totally different. It uses magnets, radio frequency waves, computers, and skilled human labor to make pictures of our bodies. And um, I want to illustrate how the machine works. by This is a PBS graphic, and you can find it on their website. And I think it's interesting to look at this, both to get a sense for how MRI works in some basic way, but at the same time to think about this as a cultural story that is... Um, explaining MRI in a particular way. So I'd like you guys to think critically as you watch this and think about the way this story is being told. These, uh, the white machine over there is the MRI machine. It's the patient going in. And these uh, red dots that are moving around are hydrogen atoms in that patient's body, which is going to be the key object of measurement in this system. We tried this before, I did not. All right. So as you can see, this is PBS explaining uh, what it's like to, to be in an MRI machine and how it works. So I'm just going to read some of this. And again, listen to the language here. Who's the actor? Who's the agent? What's going on? So the ma MRI machine's magnetic field runs straight down the tube of the machine along the lines of a patient's body actually realigns the body's hydrogen atoms. Um, and in this case, since it's a headshot, the atoms in the head. Normally, the nuclei of the body's atoms spin on axes aligned in all different directions. But the MRI's powerful magnet realigns the protons of the body's hydrogen atoms so that they all spin along the same axis along the line down the, the length of a person's body. Now, the protons of the hydrogen atoms are facing either up or down, toward the head or toward the feet. For the most part, the direction of these atoms almost entirely cancel each other out. The ones facing one direction cancel out those that are facing the other, but there are a few that are not canceled out. So here's slide two for this. The MRI machine next sends a radio pulse at the area of the body being scanned. The radio pulse makes some of the uncanceled atoms spin at a particular frequency and in a particular direction, depending on the type of tissue they make up. When the pulse shuts off, the atoms return to their natural alignment and release energy, giving off a signal that the MRI machine picks up. A computer processes the signals and produces an image of the different types of tissue. So here's the final shot. This is the output, the picture of the brain. MRI can produce very clear and detailed pictures of brain structures. Often the images take the form of cross-sectional slices. And that would be the word used in uh, medicine. That's what they'd call them, slices of the body. The images of these slices are obtained through the use of gradient magnets to alter the main magnetic fields in a very specific area while the magnetic force is being applied. This allows the MRI technician to pick exactly what area of the person brain he or she wants an image of. So in this story, you can see it's very complicated. They're sampling the activity of hydrogen atoms in the part of the body that is going to be included in the picture. Um, it is not an easy one-way relationship between your body and the output. And PBS is actually very unusual in telling a story that makes all that work and the hydrogen atoms and the measurements visible. That's unusual for a popular culture text. But where it does kind of recreate the same story, who do you notice as the actors in all of this? Who's doing all the agent, all the agency? Who's making things happen, making things work? It's the machine. It's the computer programmers. And actually what we're going to talk about as we get into this talk, that there's people that make decisions about what part of the body to include in a scan. There's people who interpret the images. There's people who then try to put it all together. And that's all missing. The only time it shows up at all in here is when they mention the MRI technician. And I just want to say that people that do this job really don't want to be called technicians. They want to be called technologists. It's an issue of professional recognition. 
So even when they bring in the actors, it's not quite right. So on the one hand, PBS has done something excellent here of really trying to make visible some of the behind the scenes working, but at the same time, they've erased all the human actors and activities that go into an MRI scan. All right, so um, how did I research MRI in popular culture and medical practice? I'm trained as a sociologist and I used a multi-method approach. I did content analysis of media sources for seven years, 1999 to 2006. And so now we're four years out and one thing we can think about as a group is how things have changed since then. It's 2010, are we telling the same stories? Um, I also did field work at three imaging units. I did um, field work at five MRI-related conferences, and I did interviews with 48 technologists. And as a sociologist, I work very inductively, where I go over that data again and again to see what themes are reoccurring, and then go back and systematically code. So everything you're going to hear today, I didn't necessarily expect to find, but as I went through the data, these were the issues that came up. So let's turn back to the title of the talk and what's going on in popular culture. And by popular culture or media, what I mean are newsprint media, newspapers, magazines, also NPR transcripts, and this is mostly accessible through LexisNexis Academic, um, and then also museum exhibits, television, show, television shows, and popular science books. And what I found going across them in a systematic way was there was three common ways MRI was talked about. And you can see as we go through them that these ideas contribute to the way MRI is perceived and they help turn it into this highly desirable technique. So the three narratives are that MRI is equivalent to the physical body, that there's no different difference. MRI is progress and MRI acts as an agent or actor. And we've already seen that third theme in the PBS example. So what I'm gonna do is just give a few examples to illustrate this, but I have many more um, that show what I'm talking about. So here, thinking about how this story that's told in the popular culture about media reveal, uh, excuse me, MRI reveals the body um, and is transparent, or in, it's a transparency machine where it's just gonna be a window into the body. You can see that in this quote, which comes from the Chicago Sun-Times. It says, super sharp scanning machines are giving doctors a clear new window into the brains of stroke victims, revealing strokes that are missed three quarters of the time by older scanners. The device is a kind of souped up MRI machine that can pinpoint spots of dying tissue deep within the brain during the first hours of strokes. So here you can, hear, you can actually um, read the window analogy, and this is something that you're going to hear. It's a window into the body. It's equivalent. The body and the image, the MRI scan, are one and the same. This is another example from Time magazine. In it, uh, the journalists write, Dr. Jay Geed has devoted the past 13 years to peering inside the heads of 1,800 uh, kids and teenagers using high-powered MRI. For each volunteer, he creates a unique photo album, taking MRI snapshots every two years and building a record as the brain morphs and grows. So again, this transparency, equivalency move, and part of the way that's done is we had window before, now we have photos and snapshots. So trying to link MRI scans to the things that we associate with transparency. So the other, uh, the second theme that occurred again and again was MRI's progress. And part of the way this was done to say MRI is better than, it's the way we want to go, is to compare it to other techniques and say that they were more primitive, they weren't as good. And so an example of this, this is the, um, the shot for a radiology exhibit that was at Epcot. And I don't know if you guys can see this because I had to distort it a little bit to fit the scan, but it's supposed to be like an eye and like radiology is the seeing eye. And this was an exhibit at Epcot about the importance of all kinds of imaging. And um, there was a particular uh, like video exhibit about MRI and in it, what happened was you got to see a doctor and an athlete interacting. And the athlete had hurt herself and the doctor listened to her patient history, ordered an MRI, did a physical exam and then says, oh, well the MRI exam has told me what's wrong with you, I can fix it and then she runs off into the sunset literally all cured and healed and, excuse me. <coughs> so what happens in that <coughs> is the physical exam is really positioned as less accurate or subjective. It is not considered as uh, objective or high quality as the MRI. And that's a very common move to compare it 
and have MRI come out as, as better. So here's an example from F, the FDA consumer re reports. Wanda Diak, Diak's ovarian cancer has not been evident for almost three years. During her follow-up exam, she says, her doctor sometimes taps on her stomach to check, check for signs of reoccurrence. The methods seem primitive to DIAC, but her doctor pointed out that before CT scans and other imaging, different sounds were all doctors had to clue them into an abnormality. I think about someone tapping on your stomach rather than having this image that essentially slices you in half so you can see inside, DIAC says. It's like the caveman to the year 2000. So same contrast. Touching, primitive, caveman, MRI progress better. And the final one, and this is my favorite because it's sort of like MRI becomes a superhero who's running around doing things. Um, these are examples where MRI is an agent. And what I mean by that gets turned into uh, an actor who runs around doing things even though it's a machine. So this comes from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, MRI scans found cancer in her brain. So it's the MRI scans finding it, not the doctors, not anybody else or other tests or diagnosis. And then the second example comes from a popular science book. And um, in it, they're talking about the Rodney King trial from the 1990s. And the author writes, the MRI showed the jury where cerebral spinal fluid had leaked through multiple skull fractures, fractures seen on the accompanying CT images into King's right maxillary sinus. So the MRI is showing the jury. It's an actor. OK. Of course, there are exceptions. As a sociologist, I like to look at the broad patterns, but you also look at the other things that are going on. There are other ways of talking about MRI, and for those of you who watch House, I think that's a great example, because in House, it's still transparent to the body, the images that are produced, but it's fallible. It is no longer the truth teller that's going to explain what's wrong with that person. Um, I should also just point out that uh, House is sponsored by General Electric, so it's one of the greatest examples of product placement in advertising that you can ever see. And so next time you watch the show, pay attention to the placement of the MRI machine and then also the credits afterwards. And then Gina Collada recently ran a great couple of articles in the New York Times talking about um, MRI and, and uh, sort of the subjectiveness of some of the exams. All right, so why do we care? Pop culture makes crazy claims all the time. That's what it does. But the issue is, is that it wasn't just contained in the pop culture. So the healthcare professionals I observed also told these similar stories about MRI um, when talking with each other, uh, with, uh, with patients, or with me. So we'll just run through this quickly, but same, same, same story. So MRI is equivalent to the body. Here's a couple quotes from my um, fieldwork notes. MRI is really the same as the anatomy labs. You can look at the anatomy perfectly, see everything. Um, now with MRI, you're going to be seeing the heart in real time. You're going to be seeing the lungs in real time. You're going to be marching through the body with MRI, so the collapse. MRI is progress. Physical exams are guesses as to what is really going on. The imaging is really key, said a radiologist. Uh, a referring physician said to me, using MRI, one can easily look and see that there is a disc problem in the back. It's all very cut and dried. It's not like, oh, well, I can do an examination on you and tell you that you have some sort of lower back pain. We don't know exactly what's causing it. It's probably a disc. So again, you see the contrast really working to shore up the authority of MRI. And then finally, and I thought this was the most interesting because it erases the labor of these people themselves. As a radiologist said, uh, this, this is the MRI's agent story. It was MRI that diagnosed the problem. MRI has told me that the patient has had strokes, but I don't know what caused it. Another radiologist said, MRI shows you so much, it's just so fantastic, it shows you everything you have to see. And then a referring physician said, here's an equipment which allows you to know a lot and peeps into your body and has the ability even to look at functions and things like that. Um, so this peeping is sort of interesting and I'd be happy to talk about that <laughs> in Q&A. But what's interesting to me about this is they're the ones interpreting the image. They're the ones making the images, the radiologists, have meaning, yet they erase their own labor and they say, oh no, the MRI is telling me that. And I had a couple thoughts on that, and I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. But one of them is I think uh, when you shore up, and this isn't being done consciously, but when you shore up the status of a machine and you're associated with the machine, you benefit indirectly, right? Like if the machine I work with is this objective, truth-telling machine, then I am going to have more status as someone who works with it. And I think the other thing is there's a lot of pressure on radiologists to find pathology or not in these images. And that, um, 
by saying the MRI is doing it, it becomes an emotionally distancing technique in a very difficult, challenging situation. All right, so why are these three stories going around in these different realms? Why do me medical professionals, news media, TV dramas use them again and again and again? And why are they so compelling? So I think there's two things that are really at play here. One is that uh, we live in a cultural context with sayings like seeing is believing, a picture is worth a thousand words. And in the English language itself, many words that mean to know or to be true have a visual connotation. So I've just put some up here so that you can see this, like words that you might not think of, like reveal, survey, demonstrate. They all come from um, Latin, French, different, that have a visual connotation. And this is very interesting about English, that knowing gets equated so much with seeing. The other thing is, and uh, historians have documented this, that we're in a moment, and the idea comes out of Europe, and it's been since around the 19th century, is that machines, mechanical reproduction, is believed to create precise and impartial knowledge, whereas human beings create subjective, um, messy knowledge, right? It's not as good. And so this idea that the mechanical re reproduction produces reliable, neutral knowledge helps um, with these meanings that are attached to MRI because it's a very high-tech machine. And I'm going to show you some pictures in a second. It's huge. And um, through the mechanical, mechanical reproduction, we get the idea that it's this pre precise, objective technology. And this is, uh, I don't know if you guys have read Atul Gawande's work. He's a surgeon who writes popular books. Um, and this comes from one of his earlier books. And he, this quote illustrates the status according to, accorded to machines in medicine. Um, and he writes, Western medicine is driven by a single imperative, the quest for machine-like perfection in the de delivery of care. When I'm in the operating room, the highest praise I can receive from my fellow surgeons is you're a machine, Gawande, you're a machine. Thus, MRI is seen as an infallible, objective, autonomous, picture-producing machine. And these qualities, especially with the meanings attached to seeing in the visual, give MRI an almost sacred status. All right, what do I mean by sacred? I don't mean um, that it's necessarily part of an organized religion, but rather what I'm talking about is the status ascribed to the machine, ascribed to an object. And so this idea of the sacred draws in part on the anthropologist Emile Durkheim's idea of the sacred. And what he focuses on with this is that groups of people can confer a special status on a person, on an idea, or on an object. And I think that MRI has entered the sacred realm. And that might change, because I think house is an interesting example, because it's becoming routine on house, and routine is not sacred. So we'll see what happens. But here's some examples from my interviews that, to me, suggest this technology and its output has a special um, place in our cultural imagination or in our society. So here's some uh, quotes from physicians. I feel a thrill when I look at MRI exams. It's nothing short of a miracle to be able to look at the body through MRI. I'm still always in awe when I see an MRI exam. I stare at them for hours, said a physician. And finally, a radiologist said, God, these pictures are beautiful. So it's miraculous language, right? Miracle, awe, beauty. And then here's some other quotes to sort of illustrate this point. A brain scan was exquisitely beautiful because it was a face and a head, and you could see the profile, said a radiologist. There are clearly cases right now that without MRI, I'd be shooting in the dark. MRI provides me with the light to decide what path of a different therapy I'm going to take. So light, very Christian kind of image, um, exquisite. But these are words of awe and reverence. So not necessarily, you know, like a Christian or a Jewish religious practice, but more the secular understanding of the sacred at play. And what's interesting is advertisements pick this up. So this is an ad for uh, an open MRI machine in Connecticut. So part of this is just lighting, right? They've got to light the machine for the ad. But it's interesting how the light goes right to the, that's called the bore, where the, the patient's body is, and lights that area up. And again, thinking about light as this Christian um, sign of, of sacredness. And this is, you see it in this one too, where the light shines out of the hole, the bore. Right in the middle, that's where the patient would go, into the light. <laughs> so for those of you who watch The Ghost Whisperer. Um, all right, so through these narratives, MRI becomes a sacred technology that produces transparent, authoritative, authoritative knowledge. And the healthcare professionals I, uh, I interviewed participate in these narratives. 
which I think is interesting because they speak with the authority of science and it gives them more, these stories, more weight. Now that's not to say people don't disagree or contest them, but these were just sort of the big patterns that I was seeing in this project. But what's interesting to me is that there's a difference between what healthcare professionals say and what they do. So these are the stories that are circulating, but how does it hold up to what's going on in medical practice? And can we just follow the light of MRI into our cure and into our truth? So what I did was I used field work to follow the users of this technology. And by users, I mean the technologists, the radiologists, and the referring doctors. And once we start following them, we can see that MRI doesn't render the body transparent. It's not a window or a photograph. But instead, what I'm going to argue is that we see that MRI exams etch together bodies, machines, and work practices to constitute a particular body in medical practice and social life. Still valuable, still of use, but a little different than what we've been taught to think about it. So this is an MRI suite, and there's the machine. It's a closed machine, and the patient would go in the bore, the hole. And then that computer screen over there that you can see is where the technologist would sit and make decisions about how much of your body to sample and include in the series of scans. And that's the other thing to remember with MRI. It's never just one scan. It's a whole series. It's not like an x-ray where you get one x-ray. So technologists are trained. They usually have a two-year college degree. Um, and they're trained to work with MRI machines and patients. And they make the decisions that create the actual pictures, the scans, the output. Um, and what they have to do is they have to make many decisions about how much of a person's body to include in the series of scans. So just like a photographer, they're going to have field of view. They're going to have resolution. They're going to have slice thickness. So what they do is they go through your body as slices and they have to decide how thick that's going to be. How much of that area are they going to sample? They make those decisions. Um, there's no radiologist looking over their shoulder to double check and see what's going on. Um, now, the thing about this, though, is that a lot of these decisions about how much of the body to, or how many hydrogen atoms to include in the, in the scan are also trade-offs against time. So, for instance, the thinner the slice, the longer the, the exam will take. But the thinner the slice, the more um, of the body can be sampled and included in the image. So um, images based on wide slices simultaneously take less time to produce and include less anatomical detail than images based on thin slices. Wider slices can potentially erase small lesions or other important atom anatomical details that would have been included in thinner, thinner ones. And what happens is, and this is not you know, sometimes a short exam can make sense. Maybe they're looking for something big. So it's not like, oh, I need a long exam every time. That's not what we're talking about. But just to understand that those decisions have trade-offs in terms of resolution and um, specificity. The technologists I interviewed and observed were very aware that their, dis their decisions shaped the content of these exams. So here's one technologist. He said to me, it's easy to tweak the parameters. And parameters is the word that they use to describe all those choices. It's easy to tweak the parameters to make something that's not there. You can also hide lesions. If you knew where a lesion was and you pointed it out to me, I could make it so that the lesion can be in the gap. And you could go through the liver or the brain, and you would never see it. So the way MRI works is in between the slices, you have to leave a gap. Otherwise, there's an artifact called crosstalk. So you have to have a space. That's just the nature of it right now. That may change. Um, and that's what he means when he says gap. Another technologist said MRI scans are all smoke and mirrors. So they're well aware that their decisions are shaping the content and that these scans are in no way an easy one-to-one -one correlation with a person's body. So now if we move over to the next set of users, the radiologists, and what they call the, work they, the room they do their work in is the reading room, which is kind of interesting. That's their language, and they, they say they read the exams. We also can see that MRI scans do not speak or offer transparent windows into the body because humans must interpret them. Radiologists have to do um, a lot of cognitive work translating the scan content into a written report. And this is often the only thing the patient will see is the written report. They often don't see their own um, MRI scans. And what, what the radiologists do is they sit in front of a screen, they dictate a verbal interpretation of the content, and then that written report is forwarded over to the referring physician. And radiologists have de developed language to describe moments where the image is different from the physical body or where the image doesn't reveal the truth about a person's well-being 
or health. So I want to talk about some of this. So artifacts, we just mentioned a little bit before. Artifacts is a word that they would use to talk about um, things that show up in the image that are a result of like either the slices being too close or some technological reason. But sometimes these artifacts can look like disease. And a radiologist has to figure out whether it is an artifact called crosstalk or is it MS? Because sometimes crosstalk looks like MS. So they're doing a lot of work sitting there. And this language shows us that they are well aware that this is not an equivalent to the body kind of situation. The other ones are some, some radiologists use the term old friends. So for instance, a bright spot in MRI, which might mean disease in many people, might be normal for you. And the radiologist will call that an old friend. He's like, I see that old friend. That goes with that person. UBOs, unidentified bright objects, same thing. Lots of times they're going <laughs> to, it's probably not reassuring, but lots of times there's UBOs in your head or in your wherever. And the radiologist has to identify it as a UBO and not pathology, right? That's what's at stake. Do they call it disease or do they recognize it as artifact? It's highly skilled work. And then finally, uh, the other language that points to the fact that radiologists know through their work that the, the image isn't trans, a transparent window is the phrases under diagnosis and over interpretation. So under diagnosis describes situations in which the radiologist interprets the anatomy in the image as normal, but then later findings and other uh, physicians' in, uh, test results, things like that, suggest that it was actually pathology. So under diagnosis is when a radiologist misses pathology that's there, and over interpretation is the opposite, when a radiologist labels something in the image pathology, but it's in fact normal. So radiologists are well aware of this, and here's some quotes that illustrate this. So one radiologist said, you hope that they see everything, but that isn't the case. There have been studies that suggest that radiologists may miss 35% of the findings on any given image. And this isn't because they're bad at what they're doing, but it is normal to miss some things. And I think when we have the idea of transparency or that these MRI exams are going to tell us everything about our health and illness, we don't understand that a good radiologist still misses it, you know, a certain percentage of the time. Here's another quote that shows what's at stake with this kind of work. There was a patient at blank that was scheduled to have a resection of a pineal tumor. It turned out that it was an artifact from a flow void. The neurosurgeon who scheduled the operation for that same day said, I just want to make sure that we are looking at the same thing. He put the film up in front of me, and I said, we're looking at a flow void in the third ventricle. He said, really? That's not a pineal tumor? I said, no, that's not a pineal tumor. And he said, oh, good thing I showed it to you. So this person didn't go to surgery. So this is an example where the, <laughs> where the, the artifact, the flow void, was read, interpreted by another radiologist as a, as a tumor, and the person was going for, um, for surgery for something that was, was not there. And then finally, if we move over to the next set of users, the referring physicians, we again see that the MRI can't stand alone as this knowledge-producing, truth-producing machine. And um, MRI scans are never the only technique that clinicians use to create a diagnosis. It's one technique of many that the clinician must try to evaluate and try to figure out, that uses to, to try to figure out what's wrong with the person. And the other techniques they're using can be blood tests, it can be uh, physical exams, it can be patient history. It's all these different things that the clinician needs to put together into a whole um, diagnostic package, and it changes. And they're well aware, like I said, that the MRI can't be the only source of the diagnosis. So one neurologist said to me, the MRI scan is probably negative up to 25% of the time in my multiple sclerosis cases. So I would usually trust my exam much more than the MRI scan. And I should say here that MRI is used often with MS. This is a frontline diagnostic tool for it. So if in this case it's 25% in his experience, that's very interesting. This is not, um, this is a place where it's routinely used. Okay, and then a, a neurologist also said to me, say a patient gets an MRI and it shows a lesion that is of no clinical consequence. Now you're left with doing the backtracking and saying you're neurologically normal. This bright object in your brain is of no significance. It has no correlation with the headache that you have. You just have a headache. So in this case, if you just had the MRI, you might think um, something's really wrong. You have a lesion, but it's not. It's a UBO or it's an old friend for you. And so when we're... Um, push to go to the mall to get our, you know, our full body MRI scans or our MRI scans and pay out of pocket. I think we need to keep these things in mind. It's a great technology, but it can't be the one shop, one stop diagnosis. So as we follow the MRI scans through medical practice, 
We see that all, although useful, they are not transparent windows into our bodies, nor do they always yield the definitive, definitive diagnoses. Okay, again, why does it matter? So what? Let's go. Um, well, the reason it matters here is that it, when you start to think about our policies and the bigger scene in which American medicine works. So, in terms of the production of scans, in the U.S. there are no regulations about MRI parameters such as like slice thickness or field of view. Now, of course, things like fear of litigation, um, the desire to do a good job are going to keep imaging centers trying to produce good quality exams. But there's a lot of freedom there in terms of how they choose what level, uh, what quality of exam they want to produce and how good they want their interpreters to be. Um, the other thing that's happening is we have a fee-for-service reimbursement system um, that rewards units for every scan, every patient they get through the machine. So there's a financial incentive to push patients through. At the same time, there's no regulations about your parameters and how good or bad that MRI scan should be. And then finally, we have all this happening at the same time um, where the amount of time spent on a clinical exam is really decreasing, right? So you have a system that's rewarding people for pushing bodies through that machine as fast as possible, which means decreasing the amount of time, potentially, of the person in that exam, maybe decreasing the quality of the exam, the content of the exam produced. And then if you think about the radiologist's work, um, in terms of the interpretation of exams, most health insurance policies reimburse for only one interpretation, even though numerous studies show accuracy increases when two radiologists interpret the same images. Um, and secondly, the formal evaluation of radiologists' interpretation ability is up to the will of the institution. So, for instance, a hospital may take a bunch of radiology reports and send them out to an independent party to see how the radiologists are doing, but there's no requirement about that, and some, some hospitals do it, some don't. So some of the checks and balances that you might expect to be in there aren't in there at this point. Again, there's other checks and balances. Fear of liability is one, the desire to do good work is another, but the whole system is setting up a lot of incentives to push people through fast, and I think it depends in part um, on us all sort of accepting the idea that these are transparent windows, like it doesn't matter who reads it, it doesn't matter where it's done because they're all equivalent. And finally, I just want to say that um, in the U.S., any MD can legally interpret MRI scans and they don't need particular training in MRI interpretation. So it doesn't have to be a radio, it could be any MD at all. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So this is from a technologist. She, she was curious about an exam she did that was a pelvic exam. And, um, she was wondering why the written report was so different than what she had noticed in the exam, so she started researching the person who signed their name to the report. And what she found was, she said, I researched who read the exam, and it was a neuroradiologist. A neuroradiologist shouldn't be reading a pelvic exam. But he was the radiologist on duty that day, and instead of saying he was incompetent to read it, he read it. So this is in a highly specialized hospital where the radiologists are down to particular body parts and particular um, types of technology. So again, it doesn't happen very often, um, but if we're not even thinking about those questions, we're not asking them so we don't know who read, who interpreted your results. So the institutional context in the U.S. emphasized the production of low-quality MRI exams. And although people and units may resist these pressures, they exist and weigh upon MRI use. And these contexts do not draw upon the technologists or physicians, what I would call tacit knowledge, or the knowledge they've gained from doing work about MRI scans. The idea of MRI as sacred, an expensive, complicated technology that can provide a transparent window into the body, helps keep these policies unknown and unquestioned. So of course, MRI scans are valuable diagnostic tools, but what I'm suggesting today is it's better to think of them as etches that bring together the body, institutional context, technical decisions, and they become one of our bodies in medical practice, but they're far from equivalent to our body or should substitute for a clinician putting together the whole all the sets of information. So uh, I've done more work on MRI and visualization in medicine, and I look at other issues, and this is my book, Magnetic Appeal, and it's all taken up in there. So if you have any interest in it, that's it. It does actually shine, as we were talking about earlier. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have.
How did you become interested in MRIs? Did you have some reason to question the uh, way that they were thought about or talked about? You've invested a great deal of research time in sussing it out, but what was that initial kernel of interest? Yep. Um, when I started this work years ago, there were two things happening that I thought were interesting. One was we were going through our first round of health care reform under the Clinton administration, and I was really struck w with the policy discussions that were happening. So why don't we want to be Canada? A lot of you guys are probably too young, you probably don't remember this, but we don't want to be Canada because they don't have as many MRI machines. And I found that amazing. Like what a potent symbolic object that we were going to use that as the reason why we didn't want to be Canada. I mean, there might be other reasons, but to pick that as a salient one. And the other thing that was happening at the same time, there was a lot of pop culture, you know, Time Magazine, Life Magazine still existed at that point, and their covers and whole issues would be dedicated to medical imaging technology. And the claims that were made were quite remarkable. And I just, you know, wondered how, what would the people who work with the technology think about these kind of stories? And I also wondered how common are these stories? Is Time Magazine just being, you know, unusual at that point? Or is that actually a common way? And so I was very surprised when I systematically went through the different forms of print media and visual media that it was such a common storyline. Um, I would have thought there was more uh, variety. So those were the reasons. And, you know, um, it's been an interesting journey to follow it around through medical practice. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, to, two questions. Uh, first, uh, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what you think is unique about the reception and, and of, of MRI and the way physicians talk about it compared to other technologies. Uh, I'm, I'm struck a little bit by the fact that um, it, the way it, it's given agency is, is really no different than the way we talk about labs uh, or, or, a, or a variety of other things. And the, and the sort of uh, treatment of it as sacred, uh, wonder how much is it is is particularly in the period that you were working is its novelty and the changes in the in the technology at that time so is this really just a question about technology uh, reception within the medical community uh, the other question um, I'm curious if the uh, if the physicians with whom you spoke uh, were explicit about their use of MRI to rule things out rather than rule things in uh, in diagnosis when we think about diagnostic technologies it's often about finding the problem, but in practice it's, it's often, well, faced with this uncertainty, I want to make sure that there isn't something really scary here that we need to rule out, or that, that we can do something about that's going to kill the patient. Uh, and I wonder if, if docs were, were explicit about that, or if that was largely beneath the surface. Okay, sure. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do a comparison of MRI with the other imaging technologies, too, to see if these same stories are told. I didn't do that, so I can only speculate on what goes on. I do know that within medicine, there's a hierarchy of how these, image, these technologies are viewed. Not necessarily, they all have a really important place to be used, but for instance, ultrasound, they often make fun of the grainy pictures. It's, it's not as capable of the transparency story because of the way the output looks. Um, and MRI is a lot bigger. And I think what's interesting and unique about MRI, MRI is the magnet. So one of the things I didn't show you guys is the magnet is very powerful. And anything metal that comes into that room will start moving, like at 30 miles an hour, towards the bore. And so there's wonderful um, demo tapes from the manufacturers that show like stretchers or oxygen tanks. And you know, the sad thing is, is that when that happens, when metal comes in, people get hurt and get killed. It does not happen very often, which is incredible given the power of that um, magnet and the, the, the ability of the technologist to keep people out with metal. So I think, I think you're right that we do ascribe agency to a lot of things. But I think what's different about MRI is its size and this magnet thing that in medical practice, they don't even call it MRI. Like, people that work with it call it the magnet. They'll be like, oh, I have to go work with the magnet. I'm going to do. So it becomes this really um, interesting agent in a way that I don't think, like, a, another kind of technology can't pull it off, right? And then in terms of the rule out, that's a really important point, right? Lots of times tests aren't used to find a medicine. They're used to rule things out. But even beyond that, the doctors, the referring doctors I was to, were frustrated because lots of times they felt like they were ordering MRI as a legal backup and not really because they needed it through, I mean, neurology is really interesting for those of you guys who have any involvement with it. They have developed over decades a lot of different kinds of tests uh, that help pinpoint what's going on in a person's brain. So they often have a very good sense of what's going on, but they have to now order tests as backups to cover their butts, right? And 
The other thing that's interesting that's been happening in med schools is that in the rotations now, they'll start teaching the med students what will hold up in court, which, so, no, you're, you're absolutely right about ruling out, but I think there's a lot more going on there. So, um, the other use of MRI is fMRI for functional tests, and I, I think they're the, the kinds of misinterpretations that people are ascribing to what you see in an fMRI is even, even more dramatic. So, have you considered following that part, too? I haven't followed that because I'm really interested in clinical medicine and it's still really more in a research, research mode, but there are people out there doing that research and really looking at some of the assumptions and leaps that are being made about claims about what those images show versus what we can use them for as diagnostic tools. So there is some interesting work coming out soon from other scholars about it. But yeah, you make a, you make a good point about that. <laughs> That's a whole different, it's a similar can of worms, but even more extreme, I think. Um, <clears throat> did you get a sense of, in talking to the people in your interviews, uh, of any types of correlations between their true fundamental knowledge of the physics and the engineering of the device and how they place this as a status? Um, you know, is, is the fact that this technology is placed at a more sacred status because they just don't understand it and they don't understand the artifacts or the limitations? Most people that, even the residents and the referring physicians, really didn't seem to have a handle on how MRI worked. That was not, they didn't really have a strong understanding. Now, some did, but the, the ones I observed, most did not. And I found myself in a funny position sometimes of being in a <laughs> unit, being like, well, no, that's, you know, trying to explain it. But they just were working with the output. And lots of times, they're just working with the written report. So they don't need, I mean, it makes sense, right? They don't need to know that level. Um, I don't think it's just... You mean, if they understood about the hydrogen atoms, would it become less sacred? Is that sort of, yeah, I don't know. Because there's something about that visual image that culturally grabs us in a way. Like even people who know it, right? The radiologists that I observe, they know exactly what's going on. They understand how the technology works. But they would also just be in awe at some of the beauty of these pictures. And that, to me, as a sociologist, is interesting. What, what is so beautiful uh, about it? So I don't think it's just ignorance. Uh, sort of follow up on the last question. Actually, in certain areas of scientific research, you see that, that for instance, uh, something may be very theoretical and people just sort of, you know, use that card. It, it, it doesn't necessarily understand what's going on and, and, and so on. And in, for instance, in the oil industry, that it's very specialized. There are people who produce these seismic images which basically is like your ultrasound. And then there are people who interpret them in terms of the geology. Then there are people who make decisions as to whether they spend $10 million to drill. And typically, you know, each of these uh, hierarchies, they, they really don't know what the other people are doing. They're completely counting on the written report, if you want. But it's, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, it really isn't. Initially, when MRI was introduced to medical practice, right, it took a lot longer. It was sort of like the initial computers where we could get more into the hard drives. So some of those older physicians are more aware, but now that it's so polished and they're, they're seeing the output. Well, uh I'm curious about the, the language about kind of data acquisition of sam sampling, capturing, snapshots. Um, so what, what goes on? I mean, because clearly they, they understand that they're, they're losing something in this capturing of, of data. Um, and is it juxtaposed to, in a sense, an analog way? Because some of the quotes you mentioned, Fisher were saying, well, I trust my, my examination much more than I, I trust the MRI. So do you see that there's a tension between kind of traditional examination and these um, diagnostic tools based on um, this perception of what it means to digitize this information because, you know, in various different forms, they, you know, for instance, music, people talk about the, the loss of, of data. Um, so are there's, there's this tension between these two communities in that way, or is that even part of the discussion? I hadn't thought about the distinction between the physical exam, something they have more control over, 
versus something they're farming out. I, I don't know about that, but I do know, um, I never heard anyone talk about data loss. Never. The radiologists were never concerned about loss of data. They weren't, they felt like whatever, sometimes they'd be concerned if just the wrong exam was done because MRI is not a screening procedure, so the, the referring doctor has to be very clear about what part of the body they, the referring doctor wants to look at. And if the technologist misinterprets that or if the referring doctor is not clear and they're not sampling the right, they don't even use the word sam, I'm using the word sampling to try to disrupt some of the visual. Um, that's when I saw people get, radiologists get upset. It was like the wrong part of the body was in the picture, but not in terms of the picture itself not having enough information. So, um, and you know, sometimes you don't need all that. I think that's the thing too. In the U.S., we get so focused on more is better, more precision is better. We don't need to see the little tiny lesions. I mean, that might not be so, that might not be the way you should take this talk is walk out of here and be like, I want an hour exam and I want to see every lesion in my head, right? Like, more data isn't necessarily better. Like, there might be enough in what they've done to figure out what they need to figure out. But no, I didn't hear any of those narratives about concern about that. Oh yeah, no, no, they participate in that. So like what's interesting to me, I did a little comparative project with Japan. Um, the US will get on the bandwagon where they want, they keep, um, so the strength of the superconducting magnet is related to the kinds of resolution and output that are quality of output are poss possible. So what does the US do? We get right in the band, the bigger the, <laughs> the bigger the magnet, the more powerful the magnet, we want that. So we've gone from one Tesla to 1.5 to three to five, and we keep upping the ante as if somehow that more information is going to be, so they do participate in that, where more is better, newer is better, we want more, but they don't mourn the loss, like it, they're focused forward. Now, in contrast, Japan isn't like that. There's only preliminary work on Japan, but Japan will invest, Japan uses, has and uses MRI more than we do per capita. But what's interesting is they don't seem to do the escalate, like the arms race of escalating how powerful the magnet is. So they'll have a lot of 1.0s because it's good enough. They don't need to have all this high resolution, contrast, getting the time. They just need to know whether they're ruling out or doing this what, to get the job done. And I think part of it is because the visual part of the exam isn't as culturally powerful. That's not what, they don't get excited about the picture. They get excited about MRI as information. So when you start thinking about his information, then the quality of the image becomes less important. It's just, it's fascinating to me in that part of it. But yeah, no, the more data, better. Uh, to what extent do you think that, uh, for, for some of the physicians that you interviewed, to what extent do you think that uh, they think that the MRI will actually like reveal everything and like it is this fantastic thing uh, versus to what extent do you think they're just pushing their agenda? Like of course when you run a news story you want to make it sound like as sensational as possible as opposed to, you know, having like a technical report and like saying, well, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice technology, but it does have all these limitations and really it's, it's kind of okay. Like you want to make it sound as, as good as possible. Like to what extent do you think that the radiologist whose entire jobs depend on, you know, the uh, promoting the accuracy of their technology and such, to what extent do they do so and like play, uh, play up the um, ability of the MRI to further their own uh, agenda? Yeah. Um, well, there's two different points. Like one is how the news reports it. And I really think it's another great example of this indirect marketing. Because when you read the news coverage, except for a few exceptions, like we were talking about, like Gina Colada's article in the New York Times, they don't really talk about all the human decisions and all the different ways MRI is shaped and affected and used. And it really is a form of marketing. It's not news, it's marketing. And some radiology organizations or hospitals can participate in that, right, by being quoted and by being included as the press release about their new MRI machine. So there's that going on. But in terms of the radiologists themselves, the ones in practice who aren't speaking directly to the press or just, you know, doing their work, I think they do both. And that's what I find so interesting is that they can, t they can see the beauty. This is amazing technology. I mean, I've spent this whole hour trying to push it out of the amazing category, but it actually is amazing. It's huge. It's loud. I mean, how many people have had an MRI exam here? Yeah, right? So it's, you feel like you're in a train, right? For those of you who have never had it, you go into the, the, the open part, the bore, and it starts clanking. The gradients start clanking. It sounds like a train's coming through, but it's huge. You're on the Star Trek. In the book, I talk about this. Because the doctors, the radiologists, the technologists, they're still in awe. It's, a, it's an incredible technology. 
and it has lots of bells and whistles, literally, <laughs> not just figuratively. But at the same time, they know what happens in clinical practice, and they know they need to put lots of things together to figure out what's wrong with the person or what's right with the person, and they need time to do that. And what's happened is their time has not been valued. So now you have doctors writing books, like uh, the book How Doctors Think, to try to make an argument for we need to value the time doctors or nurse practitioners, whoever the clinician is, to think and to try to put it all together. But see, we don't value that if we put all our hope and investment in MRI or some other technology to bypass the humans. We think we're bypassing the humans, but we're not. So in answer to your question, I think the radiologists, and the they hold both. They these machines are, you know, some don't. Some think it's foolish or whatever. But for the most part, they're beautiful, awe-inspiring machines. And we need to have some reverence for the clinical practice, too, because that's where the action has taken place. So. Uh, do you think those uh, physicians or professionals using MRI uh, wish to learn more about the basics of MRIs? Or if not, uh, is it because they think it's too difficult or they just don't care? What was the first part of the question? So uh, the question is, uh, do the, those physicians and professionals using MRI wish to learn more about the basics of MRI? Which of them know the basics? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't do a little. <laughs> I would be uncomfortable saying that because I did not go around testing their knowledge. I was just, I was doing a qualitative project, so I was listening to people talk, I was talking to them about it. I don't know how many referring physicians know. And the other thing you got to remember, it's not just referring physicians ordering MRIs. It can be, it depends on the state, right? Because in the U.S., every state has its own set of laws and their own set of regulations about who's empowered. So in California, certified Chinese medical doctors can order tests. They're considered primary care doctors. That's true in New Mexico, too. Some states, nurse practitioners can order them. So there's a whole bunch of people who order MRIs in the US. This would not necessarily be true in other countries. Um, and I have no idea how many of them know how the technology, and, and I guess you also have to ask, do they need to know? They need to know what it's doing in their spot when they try to make a diagnosis. But that would be a good project. <laughs> I think he was asking, um, do, do they wish to know more? I think there's oh, a huge, wish? yeah, a huge disconnect between um, the people who develop the technology and then the people who use it on a daily basis to make diagnosis and that sort of thing. Um, and and I, I think the disconnect may be larger than it seems because um, <clears throat> it's even more than just 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 hydrogen. I mean, there, there's many types of ways you can make the, ima you know, the images look and, and I think there, there might, may be an oversimplification in how people talk about it, just because it's such a complex, you know, there's so much theory behind it, um, even a lot of the people who use it don't really understand the physics behind it, that you have to say maybe it's transparent, otherwise you're gonna sit there talking for 20 minutes, right? Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm actually curious, I mean, did you talk to anybody who's developing MRI uh, as a technology and a work in, in, in progress, physicists, engineers, who have that sort of perspective, or is it just people who do diagnosis or know how to operate it? I did talk to not current designers working on it, but I did talk to the people who are considered inventors of it and talk to them about their process and how they got there. But I think you've got to remember, too, radiologists have a big, radiologists understand how MRI works. So we've got to distinguish between the referring doctors who may or may not, but radiologists, that's what they're trained to do is work with ultrasound and work with, and they tend to know. And there's interesting shifts going into the demo, demographics of radiology now, like who's becoming a radiologist? It's becoming much more of a techie person, engineer, like people who are interested in that kind of knowledge. So we have to distinguish which kind of medical profession knows or doesn't know. But they do. And the technologists know, too. And um, you don't think so, but we can disagree. <laughs> they know more than a lot of other people. Let's put it that way. And um, I don't, again, it, it's a question of, okay, what does is, what is the knowing get? Um, I don't disagree with you. I think a lot of people don't know how MRI works. I think a lot of people never see MRI scans. That's what you got to remember. By the time it gets back to the, clini the clinician, the referring person, they're getting a written report. So what, what do we gain by them knowing how it works? Is that going to really improve the, the situation? Well, well you know? I think part of it is maybe um, knowing which scans to run. It's not just a, a question of running, running uh, you know, lung scans or, or head scans. There's, it, there's almost that's infinite what, yeah. flexibility. Maybe that's a, a dangerous statement to make, but... Um, 
but uh, I would be surprised if the people who, who do use it on a regular basis, I mean, there, there's a huge disconnect on both sides. I, I think the people who do the technology don't understand what the physicians have to do, and even the radiologists, and the people, who, the radiologists may not have as deep an understanding of the technology and its, its limitations or true capabilities, so. Yeah, well, we'll have to take it up, because I do argue in the book that the technologists are more knowledgeable than people give them credit for, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that these sites are really different. There isn't a lot of, if, for all the talk of standardization in medicine, there isn't as much as you would expect, right? So the, the quality of MRI scans and MRI units really varies quite a bit, and we don't have a handle on that. Yep. Hi, yeah, I'm a clinician. So, and we use this technology quite a bit, and it really does help save people. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, people in here I know are probably scientists, and I graduated from here with a number of science degrees. So most of the people who, that I know use this technology actually do know quite a bit of physics about it. And uh, as she was saying, it's, um, there's a lot you can do with the larger magnets and, and different things like that, and it's definitely a frontier, and sometimes you feel like a pioneer working with it, but I think it, it is towards the better of, of, uh, uh, to, to try to uh, advance the technology and use it as best you can. And uh, the difference between uh, waiting and seeing if something is cancerous or waiting and seeing if something is torn in terms of being able to mitigate that for somebody quickly and efficiently in an effective way in a clinical setting that's safe in our country, it's, it's profound. And I think to relieve pain and suffering for people and preserve life is really what a lot of these technologies are, are here for, and we're very blessed to have it them to the extent that we do. So I, I uh, realize it's easy to kind of be in the science mode and think, oh, those physicians don't really know this or that about it, but most of the people I know in the area are quite well versed and, and do come from this kind of technological background. And if a clinician doesn't know what kind of test to order or has a question, they'll call the radiology team and ask, what do you think? This is what I'm concerned about. What would be the best image? What's going to give us the best yield? Uh, so that that patient is taking care of the most effective way and at the least expense, hopefully, to the situation. So I just, I think it's easy to lose that perspective um, in, in what uh, people are hearing here. And I just want, it, want you to understand these do help us save, save life. And I should say, too, radiology has been on the forefront. One of the things to get past, right, it's not a drug. So what it has to do to get past and get out in the market is very different. Uh, an MRI system or an MRI application. And so there is no efficacy studies of this. They don't do comparisons of MRI to say CT or other kinds of tests to see what it's adding in terms of its value. And radiology has now been taking up those kinds of studies to start to see, and they've led, they've led this to try to see when and where do different tests add value, when can it be done cheaper, or when do we have to do it. But that's gonna be a long road because the US healthcare system is very decentralized, so we don't have, um, those kinds of studies, or when they're done, they're sometimes hard to find. You have to look in the different journals. There's not a centralized source for them. So that's just something that they have. Radiologists have been very responsible in that way. Right, and bear in mind, I mean, you could say, well, you could get a similar type of a yield with a CAT scan, uh, but the radiation dose somebody's exposed to, especially if you're dealing with a child uh, versus you know somebody in a different situation, is, is very different and something to consider over lifetime dosage or, or things that you're trying to work with, especially if it's a cancerous condition or other things. So it does prevent that. Uh, just to give a perspective from the, from the veterinary world and kind of going into uh, his question, I think um, radiologists and, and technologists, they do have quite a good knowledge of physics of MR and the other image modalities, at least here with the technologists I work with. Um, I'm a veterinary radiology intern. I'm going to begin a residency this year. Um, I guess physician-wise, and I used to be one for, for some years, I, I think as, as much you begin to go into different areas and specializations, there's kind of um, maybe too much to ask for to knowing imaging physics for, for those people. I, I agree with uh, what you said. I think they, they, most of them probably know how far they can go and, and when they have to, to come to the radiologists and ask questions. So I think it's too much to ask for, for a physician to, to know and understand physics of imaging.
Kelly will be down front. Again, thank you, Kelly, for coming to give a lecture. Um, greatly appreciate it. And I would like to also thank all of our, our sponsors, the Center of Advanced Study, the Spurlock Museum, um, and the, um, the, the group of speakers that have come in. Um, one last um, bit on the, I think it's the date, April, March, March 30th, the next Tuesday, the first Tuesday after spring break, we'll have one of our last lectures in the series by Julian Dibble, a talk entitled Little Capitalism, Real Money from Play Economies and How I Made It. Um, again, so thank you for coming out. Um, have a good afternoon on a wonderful day.